Hi everyone and welcome back to the YouTube session. Well, I'm Dr. Preeti Sharma and today we'll be discussing the second part of the microbiology crash course. This will be important for all the FMG as well as the NEAT PG aspirants. Well, if you remember well and if you've not seen, I would request you to see the previous session also. In the previous session, we've taken the first part of general microbiology under which we've covered some very important topics like scientists, microscopes, stains, bacteria, anatomy, bacterial physiology. So all of that was the first part and this comes across as the second part of the general microbiology. There are two very important topics that we'll be covering under this particular lesson. Number one, we'll be dealing with bacterial genetics and the second one that we'll be talking about is sterilization and disinfection. So I think indeed both are very important topics for the upcoming exam. Well, let's start right away. Let's start and let's begin with bacterial genetics. When we talk about bacterial genetics, we have three things that come in our mind. I'll show you these three terms that we have to know. Transduction, transformation and conjugation. And the most important thing that you need to know is that this is a genetic transfer. So basically, this is happening from one bacteria to another bacteria. So all that we need to know in these three situations is how the DNA or the genetics is transferred from one to another. So the very first out of these that we'll be considering is transduction. So who transfers material from this bacteria to this bacteria and this is by the help of something known as a bacteriophage. I'm sure everyone has seen a bacteriophage which looks something like a tadpole. If you've seen a bacteriophage earlier in the textbooks, it looks something like a tadpole shaped structure. But what exactly is a bacteriophage? When we look at a bacteriophage, all so it has the name bacterio under it but guys bacteriophage or primarily refers to it's a dna virus it belongs to a dna virus so can i indirectly say that ultimately it's a virus which is transferring material from one bacteria to another it's a virus which is doing that so let us see a particular situation let us see this is something known as generalized transduction what do i mean by that so you can all see that this is a bacteria right and uh, this is the dna of the bacteria i want all of you to note over here that uh, bacterial dna will always be circular like this bacterial dna always is circular so you can see the bacteria i am calling it the donor cell this is the donor bacteria because from here something is going to go onto this bacteria onto this bacterial cell so that is known as the recipient bacteria so we have a donor bacteria we have a recipient bacteria and you want that this DNA from here should somehow reach this DNA over here. You want the transfer to occur and who's going to come to our rescue? That tadpole shaped bacteriophage. So you can see that the bacteriophage enters first attaches. First it is going to attach to the donor cell. It's going to actually penetrate. Can you see this DNA entering? So now you'll say ma'am in this particular bacteria you've got two types of DNA. One you've got the DNA of the bacteria itself. So one, you've got the host DNA in this particular bacteria and the second DNA that you've got is the DNA of a bacteriophage is the DNA of a bacteriophage. So these are the two DNAs that are present and now more bacteriophages will form. Why so? Because I just told you bacteriophage is a kind of a DNA virus. So that is how a virus replicates. It first enters into a cell then from the different kind of DNAs that are present. Can you see more bacteriophages have formed? There are more DNA that has formed. Some of the bacteriophages have the blue color DNA. Some of them have the red color DNA. Means some of the bacteriophages have their own DNA. Some of the bacteriophages have the DNA of the bacteria, the red color one. Have a look at this. This bacteriophage has taken up the DNA of the donor bacteria. It has taken up the DNA of the donor bacteria and can you see it is now giving it to the other bacteria, to the recipient bacteria. So no one's going to make you write this down when it comes to an MCQ. What you have to know is primarily that this bacteriophage has picked up the DNA from the donor and has ultimately got it to the recipient and you can see that in the recipient the fusion has occurred the donor DNA plus the recipient DNA repeating the donor DNA that the bacteriophage got 
and the recipient DNA, which was the own DNA of this particular bacteria, both of them have recombined. And that is when I say that genetic material is transferable and is successful. So can I say in transduction, DNA goes from one bacteria to another and who is taking that DNA? Bacteriophage, which is actually a virus. But this was just one type of transduction. I called it generalized transduction. There's another type of transduction which is a little special, a little different and that is specialized transduction. Again, no one's going to make you draw this entire flowchart because luckily we have an MCQ based exam to give. However, what's the basic difference that you guys have to spot? So you will say ma'am, it's the same bacteria, it's the same donor bacteria that you have over here. It's the same bacteriophage that you have over here. Bacteriophage DNA I can see over here. Donor DNA I can see over here. This is exactly what was happening earlier. Earlier also you could see bacteriophage DNA. You could see donor DNA. But they always remained separate, separate. The bacteriophage DNA had different uh, follow-up. The donor DNA had a different follow-up. Here both of these end up becoming combined. Both of these means the bacteriophage DNA and the donor DNA. First they combine and then they split. So first they combine and then they split. But splitting or breakups are always with a lot of memories, right? When they combine, well and good. But when they split, can you see the red color, the bacteriophage DNA has not come out alone. It has taken a part of the donor DNA also. A bit of the donor DNA has also been taken. Like I said, breakups are always with memories, right? So when the bacteriophage red color DNA split back, it took a little bit of memory from the donor. And now can you see, finally, the kind of bacteriophages that you have, have a little bit of self and little bit of donor. And that is what it is going to go and give to the recipient, D, the recipient DNA or the recipient bacteria. So what did you realize? You will say, ma'am, there's something extra that has happened in this specialized transduction. And that extra is the fusion and the split up. The fusion and the split up has happened and that is considered as extra over here. So that, guys, is referred to as a specialized transduction. So two types of transductions. Number one, generalized where everything remains separate. Number two, specialized where there's a fusion and split up that is involved between the bacteriophage DNA and the donor DNA. That's the first thing that is known as transduction. Let's move on to the second one. There's something known as transformation. Now, that's also equally important. When I say transformation, I'll draw one picture for you and it will make it very simple. So when we are talking about transformation, we say that, for example, if this is a bacteria, let's consider this to be a bacteria. And this bacteria has its own DNA. So you'll say, ma'am, let's make a circular DNA like this. It has its own bacterial DNA. But now transformation, what transformation is going to occur? It's going to take up some DNA from the environment. Is there anyone getting the DNA? No, it's just going to take up free DNA is taken up from the environment. Free DNA is going to be taken up from the surroundings or it has been taken up from the environment. That is what you call as transformation. Very, very important again for your exams. Transformation means what? Just picking up the DNA from the environment. That's it. So is there any bacteriophage? Is there any bacteria, a virus, anything involved? No. Just the free DNA which is there in the environment is kind of absorbed. So transformation done. What is the last one? And unfortunately, the toughest one, that is conjugation. So let's study conjugation now, after which we'll get down to solving a few MCQs also. So what do we understand by conjugation over here, guys? Please remember, there is again going to be a transfer. But who is going to do that transfer this time? So again, we'll draw it. This happens to be the donor bacteria. And this happens to be the recipient bacteria. Now, having said that, who is going to attach between both of them? Or how is the transfer going to occur? I've made a bridge between both of them. Yesterday, if you remember, when we were studying the different types of um, you know, the different types of transfers and we were studying the bacterial anatomy, we definitely studied that what is involved in the attachment is always a pili. Do you remember this? In the previous session, we studied that what is attached in the, uh, in the, or what is involved in the attachment is always going to be 
the pi lie so same way if someone asks you what helps in transfer and conjugation so in conjugation it's always going to be the pi lie that is involved so here you have first let's see the donor bacteria we call the donor bacteria as a male and here you have a recipient bacteria we call the recipient bacteria as a female so you will say ma'am this means donor bacteria has its own dna like every bacteria has dna recipient bacteria also has its own dna so like every bacteria donor dna male dna female dna but what am i transferring i am transferring something different i am some transferring something known as f factor what is f factor f factor is a fertility factor f factor is referred to as a fertility factor which basically means that the male always has a fertility factor i call it f plus the male always has a fertility factor and now i want that the fertility factor should also go over here that is what i want i want this female did not have a fertility factor that is why this female was f negative but now i want that the fertility factor should also go over here now there's a catch guys when i say the fertility factor from here the male has gone to the female i don't mean that the main male will become negative no it's a copy it's like it will duplicate one copy will stay here one copy will go there so both of them will end up becoming positive positive none of them will remain negative so remember this just replicates copy paste it's going to make a copy and the copy is going to go here so one copy shall remain here one copy shall remain there so you will say that the male was always f positive but the female will now become f positive so what happens that is what they ask you in the paper they ask you that initially you had something called a male the male was always f positive and you had a female and the female was f negative means the male had the fertility factor the female did not have the fertility factor but in the end when this transfer occurs can i say both of them end up having the fertility factor both of them become f plus f plus i hope that's okay with everyone yes so that's what they ask you in the paper f plus and f minus when they conjugate both end up becoming f plus f plus and repeating what is f plus or what is f f means fertility factor where is this fertility factor present it is present on a circular structure called plasmid so if this is the plasmid here there is a fertility factor on top of it so if i ask you is plasmid a part of the main dna or is it extra chromosomal think logically is it a part of the main dna of the bacteria or is it extra chromosomal i think you know the answer it is going to be extra chromosomal okay well having said that the first combination is done and after i'll show you a total of three combinations after that we'll do a recap also let's come to the second combination in fact i'll just give you a quick quick recap one by one we'll write i have to tell you total three scenarios in the first scenario i'm saying that if this is a male bacteria and this is a female bacteria and both of them have their dnas like they do now i'm saying fertility factor has to go from here to here so initially the male was f plus and the female was f minus but now both of them have become f plus and f plus that's the first combination because this has gone from here to here now let's look at the second combination again this is your bacteria everyone can see this is the dna of the bacteria and this is the fertility factor of the bacteria this has a fertility factor this bacteria is an f plus so you'll say ma'am this means this is a male bacteria it has a fertility factor now you'll say just give it to the female bacteria that is what you are expecting but before this goes to the female both of these end up making a pact both of these end up fusing this is all happening in the donor only right now in the same bacteria the main dna and the plasmid repeating the main dna and the fertility factor they have recombined they have recombined what do you call this kind of a cell this kind of a cell is known as hfr that is high frequency recombinant 
it is referred to as high frequency recombinant so when the main dna and the fertility factor fuse you call it high frequency recombinant now let's consider a scenario now let me consider that over here i have something known as an hfr kind of a cell what is an hfr kind of a cell it has the dna of the host bacteria and the fertility factor which has fused they are going to now conjugate by a pilus with the f negative means a female see she has her dna but she doesn't have a fertility factor she's a female she's f negative which basically means that now the combination is going to happen between an hfr and an f negative female between an hfr and an f negative female what will happen you will say ma'am a part of it a part of both a part of the host a part of the fertility factor is going to go repeating a part of this and a part of this will go to the female but what am i saying again and again only a part of the fertility factor will go do you think if i give incomplete fertility factor will this female end up getting the fertility factor if incomplete things are coming to it no you will say ma'am in this situation the female will still remain negative she will still remain negative because you're not sending the complete fertility factor you're sending a part of the fertility factor so what did i analyze out of this that this still remains hfr in the end this will still remain hfr hfr and the female will still remain f negative so when there is a recombination or when there is a conjugation between hfr and f negative the male still remains hfr the female will get a part of two things but only a part so she will still remain f negative that scenario number 2 so repeating when there is a recombination or when there is a conjugation between an hfr and an f negative female the hfr remains as it is and the female is also going to remain f negative she does not receive the fertility factor coming to the third situation i know by now it must be getting a little uh, you know a little stressful because too many things coming up but we'll be revising in the end now let's start again from the beginning you'll say this is the donor this is the male why am i calling it a male because i can see the dna and i can see the fertility factor so this is an f plus male now when both of them try to in the same dna when both of them integrate do you agree you've come up with an hfr kind of male high frequency recombinant okay third scenario after recombining i have still not reached the other bacteria everything is happening in the same bacteria the same male bacteria the same male bacteria they fused they formed hfr now after combining they split up another breakup coming in the same male bacteria now the dna is again separate and the fertility factor is again separate but what did we learn breakups are always with memories so when the fertility factor comes back this time it carries a little bit of the dna dna of the host also so repeating first there was dna separate fertility factor separate when both of them combined we got an hfr now both of them have broken up so what you have that cell is known as f prime cell now when they break up and this carries a little bit of memories from the dna this is known as an f prime this f dash is known as an f prime cell now let's consider this male is an f prime male and this conjugates with a female female we know is always f negative so now i'm talking about f prime conjugation with f negative you'll say the f prime totally goes here so the male was anyway f prime and now the female will also become f prime so when f prime and f negative conjugate both of them end up becoming f prime let's repeat when f prime and f negative are going to conjugate when f prime and f negative are going to conjugate both of them are going to become f prime f prime so let's do a recap these are all understanding things now let's do how will i quickly solve the question in the exam so please remember whether you're dealing with simple f plus or you're dealing with f prime when the male is f plus and the male is f prime the end result is both of them becoming the same so when the male was f plus both male and female ended up becoming f plus when the male is f prime both the male and female end up becoming f prime so there's no confusion over here f plus and f prime end result both of them end up becoming that the only problem is in hfr hfr cannot make the female positive hfr cannot make the female positive 
in hfr scenario the female will always remain negative so remember f plus will make the female f plus f prime will make the female f prime but hfr will not be able to do that hfr will not do that means the female will still remain f negative that's your final summary of the conjugations that they can ask for you but honestly speaking there is no way that you can analyze this without solving questions i personally feel solving questions is the best way of doing this so let's start with question number 1 on this topic dna transfer in a bacteria via a phage is known as which of the following conjugation transduction transformation or translation so dna transfer in a bacteria that is what i told you one bacteria other bacteria and who is uh, going to do it it's a bacteriophage that's going to do it and this is the first thing that i taught you that was transduction this was transduction i hope you gradually get into the mode of solving these questions okay let's move on to question number 2 transduction is defined as what bacterial medial viral recombination viral mediated viral recombination viral mediated bacterial recombination or bacterial mediated bacterial recombination so big time confusion they've created with the options right so when i talk about this what all can you see over here okay so i see that transduction let me go back to my basic knowledge transduction is that this is a bacteria and this is a bacteria so it's definitely bacteria to bacteria it's nothing to do with virus to virus it's bacterial recombination bacteria to bacteria who carries it from bacteria to bacteria bacteriophage and what is bacteriophage like i taught you bacteriophage is a dna virus so virus is the mediator virus is the mediator and that is why the answer to this question happens to be option c because virus is mediating the bacterial recombination virus carries the dna from here to here so viral mediated bacterial recombination let's move on to question number 3 let's read the cell in which the f factor carries along with it some chromosomal genes repeat repeat read again f factor carries along with it some chromosomal genes for those who got the answer right very good this is an f prime cell what exactly were they telling you i'll ask you again this is a bacteria this is a bacteria and this is the dna of the bacteria further this is said to be the fertility factor of the bacteria this is said to be the fertility factor can i call this as the f positive bacteria i hope yes the male bacteria the f positive bacteria so this is fine this is f plus now when they combine let's draw the second scenario when they combine means this was the dna and into it the plasmid has combined if they've combined what do i call it now i call it a recombinant i call it an hfr bacteria situation number 3 now they've split up when they split up what happens you say ma'am we have the same bacteria the dna has gone separate the plasmid has gone separate but breakups are always with memories means it's carried a part of the dna from the host that is what they had asked you the cell in which the fertility factor this fertility factor carries along with it some chromosomal genes carries along with it some chromosomal genes is known as what that is what we studied that is known as an f prime cell i hope the questions are making sense now because this is something which could be you know very important but confusing in the exam let's move forward practice another question f factor integrates with the bacterial chromosome to form what so let's go back f factor integrating they are saying f factor and bacterial chromosome integrate what is the integrated version known as integrated version is known as hfr do i have hfr in the options definitely yes so the integrated version is referred to as hfr let's move on to the next question a bacterial cell in which the f plasmid is integrated with the chromosome have they just put up the same thing in a different language again you are combining the f plasmid with the dna and i know that this situation is known as high frequency recombinant like i said they can give you the same question in different languages let's practice one last question fertility factor possessing chromosomal genes is known as again fertility factor 
possessing chromosomal genes something that we just studied again a recap the fertility factor possessing a few chromosomal genes what do we have it as we call it the f prime perfect so i think everyone knows the answer the fertility factor with chromosomal genes f prime factor well having said and done with this i think we can move forward and now we go on to the next concept that you have as we had decided we are going to do two things under today's class and today's session first one was bacterial genetics which is done and the second one is sterilization and disinfection so let's get going guys when i talk about sterilization and disinfection the first thing that i want to teach you is that there will be two different kind of methods that i will be talking about so what are the methods that we have under sterilization disinfection this is going to be number one the physical methods like heating or filtration or some kind of um, you know radiation physical methods second type of method is going to be a chemical method chemical means i can use alcohol i can use formaldehyde i can use some gaseous material so either i will do sterilization disinfection with physical methods or i will be doing the same with chemical methods and first and most important type of physical method that we have is going to be heat but please note this heat gets you or heating gets you maximum number of questions because heating is just not heating with a candle or heating under the sun heating is of two types they say heating can be dry heat or heating can be moist heat so that is exactly what i'm starting with repeating heating can come as dry heat sterilization and heating can come as moist heat sterilization what do we have under dry heat uh, definitely like i told you in earlier days we used to use candles obviously no one uses candles now earlier days they used to keep the things under sunlight no one does all of that so these things are not coming to you but these two machines are definitely used hot air oven and incineration plant these are the two heating techniques that they are using in dry heat sterilization in every hospital so first i'll show you what a hot air oven looks like it looks like any other oven in your house that probably is used for baking so it's a typical oven and what all can you keep inside it you can keep any kind of glassware means you have a flask you have a flask that you are using in your lab or you have test tubes that you are using in your lab so all kind of glasswares syringes cotton swabs if you are using cotton swabs in your lab you can also add them and liquid paraffin remember this thing is something which is important greasy materials liquid paraffin paraffin wax right wax if you you guys have always seen candle wax you've seen how wax is it's very greasy so any greasy material liquid paraffin is sterilized using a hot air oven so obviously you asked me that ma'am if you're calling it a hot air oven you also must be having some heating temperatures that you have to know so remember 160 degrees for 2 hours is the usual protocol 160 degree temperature for 2 hours is the usual protocol that we have and remember for everything we'll be having a control when i say control means see whenever you're working in a lab you have to make sure that uh, are you doing the right thing is this machine calibrated is this machine working well is the electricity source okay are you using any expired material so any testing that you do in the lab any machine any test you do a control because control will tell you it's like a check it's like a check that yeah everything is working fine and what you're doing is the right method of doing it so for the control in all of these sterilization techniques they use bacteria they use bacterial spores because they feel that at 160 degrees for 2 hours if this spore is killed this means all your glassware is also sterilized that is the concept so you know how does how do you you say ma'am how do you have this how do you put it inside the hot air oven this comes in the form of strips there are strips that come which have the bacillus subtilis spore on it you just put this strip inside the hot air oven whenever you want to put your flask and glass tubes you put them along 
along with that you place one tiny little strip here because at the end the color will change different different colors come you don't have to learn the color change but at the end when the color will change you'll say yes this means the bacillus subtilis spores have been killed and if they have been killed this means my machine was working fine and this means my glassware is also perfect and i can easily use it now so for every technique please remember we will be having a particular check or a control and over here we have used a lot of things now please note we can use bacillus subtilis bacillus subtilis is also known as bacillus atrophius they are cousin brothers they belong to the same family either we can use bacillus subtilis bacillus atrophius or clostridium tetani so either of these three things will be mentioned in the paper but please remember if uh bacillus and clostridium both are mentioned then in that case please go in for the bacillus species that are there so that's the hot air oven what other thing that you have in your hospital if you ever have seen you would be knowing and if not then guys today onwards or whenever you visit your hospital please do uh, see that there's a huge incineration plant somewhere at the back of your hospital which is very very important it has two big huge chambers in the hospital and this can always be used for incinerating all the hospital waste the animal waste the human body part waste so all of these kind of hospital wastes the human body part waste at a high temperature of 1100 1200 degree centigrade so remember incineration also uses dry heat and what do i mean by dry heat there are no fumes there is no steam pure simple heating for hot air oven it is 160 degrees for 2 hours for incineration it is 1200 degrees so if i ask you this question that which of the following is this done for that is incineration is done for human body parts syringes body fluids or gloves please remember this is an fmg pyq previous year question human body parts human body parts and hospital waste incineration and i have already told you the temperature 1200 degree centigrade moving on to the next question uh let's have a look at this greasy material dusting powder paraffin wax repeating greasy material paraffin wax how would you want to sterilize them we just studied that we are going to put them in a hot air oven what fits into hot air oven gamma radiation sunlight dry heat sterilization or autoclave i think everyone knows this is a case of dry heat sterilization let's pick up the next one method of choice for sterilization of liquid paraffin method of choice for sterilization of liquid paraffin is known as i think we are clear liquid paraffin yes liquid paraffin means hot air oven and any kind of dry sterilization dry heat hot air oven <coughs> sorry let's move forward pick up another question hot air oven efficiency is best checked by which bacteria sterothermophilus subtilis tetani or streptococcus so the correct answer to the question like i told you that sometimes for hot air oven controls we have three things bacillus subtilis which is there over here bacillus atrophius and clostridium tetani so when both the options are there the best one that you'll select will be bacillus subtilis okay so having done with this question and having done with dry heat sterilization we can now move on to the moist heat sterilization what all do we have under moist heat there are three things that we've written that is the moist heat sterilization under 100 degrees the moist heat sterilization at 100 degrees or above 100 degrees so what all do we have below or what all do we have below 100 degrees or less than 100 degrees are two techniques called pasteurization as well as inspissation okay so we learn it as inspissation and pasteurization are less than 100 degrees ipl and i'm sure the fever is on to everyone ipl that is inspissation pasteurization are going to be below or are less than 100 degrees what do we have at 100 degrees at 100 degrees so if you're talking about ipl you have to talk about the bat that is boiling and tindalization are at 100 degrees and above 100 degrees when we are talking about above 100 degrees a for a we consider autoclave let's do a recap 
IPL inspissation and pasteurization less than 100 degrees BAT that is at 100 degrees we have boiling and tindalization and above 100 degrees we have autoclave out of these let's study them one by one in detail so let's start with the first category and that is going to be the pasteurization of milk the very very famous and we know that below 100 degree pasteurization IPL inspissation and pasteurization are less than 100 degrees so pasteurization has two methods Methods. One thing I know that the temperature in both the methods is going to be less than 100. So there are two methods we use for pasteurization of milk. One is the holder method and one is the flash method. The holder method is 6330. What do we mean by that? 63 degrees for 30 minutes. You are going to hold it for 30 minutes. Repeating 6330. Whereas the flash method, flash means seconds, this is 7220 means 72 degrees for 20 seconds and only seconds because this has to happen in a flash. So you increase the temperature but the timing has become seconds. So 7220 and after increasing it to 72 degrees for 20 seconds you drop it down to 13 degrees. That is what you do with milk. So let us do a quick recap guys. What are the two methods that we studied up till now? We studied something called the holder method which is 6330. 63 degree for 30 minutes and there's something called a flash method 7220 72 degree for 20 seconds and drop it down to 13 degrees which of them is now considered better the flash method is now considered better because it can even kill something that the holder method cannot and that is coxiella coxiella can be killed by the flash method so that was the first technique pasteurization if i now ask you a question based on it pasteurization of milk is done at what so you again Please read all the options. Think of what all we had studied. We had studied two methods, holder and flash. Holder was 6330. Flash was 7220. 63 degrees 30 minutes. 72 degrees 20 seconds. So we have 63 degrees 30 minutes. The first option is only looking right. 63 for 20, no. 72 for 30, no. 72 for 20, but minutes, no. Flash method is 72 for 20 seconds. So certainly the first one is the correct answer over here. Pasteurization is done. Let's go on to the other technique. The other technique is known as inspissation. That is also below 100. Remember how much below 100? I call it 80-20, 80-20, 80-20. Why did I repeat it three times? Because we are going to, or you can even learn it as 80-30 for that matter because 80 degrees is what I'll maintain for 30 minutes so let's learn it as 80 30 but this is why did I repeat it three times because this goes on for three days for example everyone has heard of two culture media have we all heard of LJ and LSS the two L medias what are the two L medias doing out here LJ Lowenstein Jensen I'm Hoping everyone knows that this is done for tuberculosis and LSS. Loeffler's serum slope is for Carini bacterium. Both of them we'll be studying under our bacteriology crash course. But these two medias, the L's and L's, they are sterilized using inspissation. So I'll take the media. I'll heat it to 80 degrees for 30 minutes on day 1, then 80 degrees 30 minutes day 2, 80 degrees 30 minutes day 3 and then the cycle is complete. So remember 80, 30, 80, 30, 80, 30 is what you have to consider over here. That is what is inspissation. So I hope below 100 degrees done so that we can come down to at 100 degree. What was the mnemonic? For at 100 degree you had to remember BAT that is boiling. Just like you boil water. We boil water for a approximately 15-20 minutes right so that we can kill the bacteria and the germs in it so that's a simple boiling I know boiling of water will always be at 100 degrees but there's a problem that boiling does not kill the spores so you say that I want a particular technique where I can kill the spores also and that technique is tindalization I've learned tindalization as t20 matches everything about IPL and batting and t20 happening here so t20 means tindalization is a 20 minute cycle but again for three days so 100 degrees is the temperature 20 minutes because t20 tindalization 20 so 120 day 1 100 degree 20 minute day 2 100 degrees 20 minutes day 3 so that is what you have in tindalization let's do a recap boiling is a single step for 15 minutes 
Tindalization is 3 days, 100 degrees, 20, 20, 20 minutes. Done with all of that, we are now coming to above 100 degree, which is autoclave. How much above 100 degree? 121 degree, 15, 15. What do I mean by that? Let's explain. So, what do you have over here? Guys, this is the classical picture that you have for an autoclave. And remember, autoclave is 121 degree centigrade that you are going to heat for 15 minutes and you are going to keep a 15 PSI. What is PSI? Pressure. So, we keep a temperature of 121 degree, timing of 15 minutes, pressure of 15 PSI. That is what you use for autoclave. However, please remember, so any kind of uh, glassware you want to keep, again, you can keep flasks, you can keep the test tubes, all of these can be done in autoclave. A lot of other things, for example, even if, uh, you know, other than instruments in the OT, you will always see that autoclave will be present in every operation theater. Why? Because all the aprons that are used in an operation theater, all the sutures, the stitches, the sutures that are used, they have to be autoclaved. You will see this machine in every microbiology lab because all the culture media have to be autoclaved. You will see this in every micro and pathology lab because sputum samples have to be autoclaved. Why do you think I am autoclaving the sputum samples? See, for example, in our country, you have a case of TB. Okay, so what will they send to your lab? What, what sample will they send to your lab? They'll send a sputum sample. Okay, you look at a sputum sample, you'll tell them whether the patient has TB or not. After that, to throw the sputum sample, to discard the sputum sample, you can't discard so many microorganisms in the environment. Before you discard or throw the sputum sample, before discarding, you autoclave it so that all the organisms are killed. So, remember all instruments, aprons, sutures, media, sputum samples, they need to be autoclaved. What's the catch point? All sutures except cat gut. Cat gut is not, will lose its, um, you know, strength. Cat gut uses the, loses its strength, loses its elasticity if you autoclave it at such a high temperature. So, you will never put autoclave, you will never put cat gut suture in autoclave. And similarly, LJ media and LSS media, these two L medias, did I tell you? You are not doing them for autoclave. Where, what are you doing to sterilize them? We just studied that for sterilization, we are using inspissation. Inspissation is for the two L medias, that is the LJ medias and the LSS medias. You don't use cat gut over here, you don't put LJ LSS in here. These are two exceptions that you have to know for the autoclave. And what is the picture that I had shown you for the autoclave? Here you go, with which they ask you a question. What is the control that is used in an autoclave? Finally, the control you want to know. Is this temperature even attained? Have I attained a 121 degree centigrade? So, please remember there is a bacteria known as Bacillus sterothermophilus. The word thermophilus tells you that this has the ability to survive at very high temperatures. But at 121, it will get killed. So, how will I get to know that 121 has been attained when this organism is killed? Bacillus sterothermophilus is the control that we use. The story is not over. You'll say, ma'am, the usual temperature that we have, we've understood, 121 degree for 15 minutes, 15 PSI. But in case you are dealing and you want to kill the prion proteins, for the prions, I'll increase the temperature to 134 degrees and the timing, just put a dot not 15 minutes, it's one and a half hours. So, remember 134 degrees centigrade with for, 100 and, uh, for one and a half hours, that is what you have to do for prion killing. Increase the temperature, increase the timing, the pressure can remain the same. Okay, so having said all of this, now if I want to do a very, very quick recap of what all have I studied up till now, I studied three things. I think IPL and BAT are very useful mnemonics. So, inspissation and pasteurization below 100 degrees, boiling and tindalization at 100 degrees and autoclave above 100 degrees. Now, if I want to uh, obviously judge myself, the best way is to solve a question. So, how are prions destroyed? Prions are best destroyed. Look at all the things written over here. Autoclaving at 135, hot air oven at 160, H2O2 that is hydrogen peroxide or sodium hypochlorite. I think we've just studied autoclaving at approximately 134 degree centigrade for one and a half hour is going to do the purpose, solve the purpose for us. So, that is how we go about with the prion proteins. 
well having said that when i got you to start with sterilization disinfection i clearly told you that there are physical and chemical methods and under the physical methods the heating method is done what are we left with let's move on to the next one we also have something called as the radiation method radiation so basically by radiation i mean i have something called ionizing radiation and non ionizing radiation that is also something that we have so let's pick up the next one heating done dry heat done moist heat done let's pick up radiation ionizing versus non ionizing what's the difference please remember ionizing radiation has something called x rays and gamma rays repeating ionizing radiation has x rays and gamma rays and do they increase have you ever heard that you went in for an x ray and temperature has increased no right so they will not increase the temperature there is no increase in temperature so can i call it a cold technique can i call it cold radiation whereas for non ionizing radiation like ultraviolet rays infrared rays they increase the temperature they increase the temperature and that is why i call them as the hot sterilization repeating cold sterilization is the ionizing radiation because x rays and gamma rays don't increase the temperature non ionizing radiation like uv rays and infrared rays they increase the temperature and we call it hot sterilization why and when do i use them that's the next point that you all have to know so please remember number 1 ionizing radiation cat gut sutures did i tell you that you were not doing cat gut sutures in autoclave that is what we studied right that when you are dealing with autoclave you can put all the sutures in autoclave but not cat gut because at this temperature cat gut is really going to suffer at 121 you don't put cat gut how do you sterilize cat gut using ionizing radiation the cold method you don't subject it to heat other than that you can use this ionizing radiation also for pre packed syringes and grafts now nowadays a lot of transplants and grafts are taking up so for grafts you will be using them non ionizing radiation means the ultraviolet rays and the infrared rays these you will be using for ot fumigation fumes in the ot basically the radiation in the ot for the ot sterilization and biosafety cabinet what is a biosafety cabinet all of you whenever you visited a microbiology lab and you must have seen that the microbiologist always sits in this small kind of a box or a chamber It's because you know the uh, micro, the microbiologist is dealing with a lot of infectious samples samples which have come from all sort of patients who could have any kind of disease so many culture plates he or she is dealing with so he or she has to be kept in a sterilized environment so that it, you know the infection does not spread all over so that small chamber in which that microbiologist is sitting is known as a biosafety cabinet how do i sterilize it usually it's an ultraviolet light that i'm using for it if someone asks you that what is the control for radiation what is the control that we have for radiation remember bacillus pumilus please remember the way you write r for radiation is the same way you write p so what is the control for radiation which bacillus it is bacillus pumilus if i ask you the question out here cold sterilization is done by remember i told you cold was what cold was that we were not going to increase the temperature the temperature was going to remain the same and if you remember ionizing radiation what all does ionizing radiation comprise of x rays and gamma rays ionizing radiation x rays and gamma rays look at the others steam steam is obviously from water the temperature will increase other than that look at infrared rays ultraviolet rays obviously with them also the temperature increases with ionizing radiation x rays and gamma rays the temperature does not increase moving on to the next one after this we come back to something known as filtration so easiest way all of you have seen an aqua guard or all of you have seen a water purifier you've seen how water has to be filtered any aqua guard or water purifier that you look at it will always have filters candle and filters inside it similarly nowadays uh, so much of air pollution that has come up the air quality has gone bad so a lot that is being sold in the market are air purifiers yes which is a big market which is now coming up what do the air purifiers what do they say in their marketing what kind of filters do they have if you ever heard or read that point carefully they say we are using hepa filters very rarely do they say we are using alpa filters so there are two kind of filters hepa and alpa they basically filter out the bacteria obviously uh, alpa is the best one that we have in the market but 
certainly the best will be the most expensive so most of the air purifiers are having hepa filters that are being used earlier they used to use something called a seeds filter even for water filtration or any liquid they wanted to filter they used to use seeds filtration but this is not used now it was found that the seeds filter the seeds filter contains asbestos seeds filter contains asbestos and do we all know that asbestos is carcinogenic it can cause cancers for example if i'm wanting to filter water if i'm wanting to filter water and i make that water pass through the seeds filter it will get elements of asbestos in it and when we consume that water it's a source of cancer it's carcinogenic so we don't use the seeds filter now now we use hepa and alpa hepa is most common but alpa is the best what is the pore size of these filters what is the for example if this is a filter what is the pore size that we have the pore size is 0.22 microns the pore size is 0.22 microns and what is the control we'll obviously have a control such a small pore size such a small filter the bacteria has to be very very small diminuta brevendi munas diminuta is what we use as the control out here so for filtration it is brevendi munas diminuta having said that why don't we do something why don't we make a list of what all controls we've studied up till now we've not finished but whatever best we can recall up till now so try to repeat with me the first technique that we studied was hot air uh, or you can say uh, dry heat so hot air oven if i'm asking you basically you're talking about dry heat sterilization so hot air oven had three things if you remember number one was bacillus subtilis apart from bacillus subtilis we could have the cousin brother that is bacillus atrophius and apart from that we could also have clostridium tetani moving on coming to the next one we had autoclave autoclave is also having something at a very high temperature so bacillus sterothermophilus we had to use a high degree or a high temperature bacteria bacillus sterothermophilus coming to the next one and that is radiation we studied that r and p looks the same so for radiation it is bacillus pumilus the next that we studied was filtration and for filtration we studied something has to be very small so we said brevendi munas diminuta brevendi munas diminuta for the filtration technique i hope up till here everyone is still in sync with us and everyone is being able to identify all these things so that we can now move on forward and study the next question glutaraldehyde we entered chemicals up till now we spoke about heat dry heat moist heat uh, filters radiations all kind of physical methods now we've entered into a chemical that is glutaraldehyde is used for all of the following except so what is the answer out here it is used for bronchoscopes proctoscopes endoscopes it is not used for thermometer remember glutaraldehyde is for all the scopes laryngoscope bronchoscope proctoscope uh, anything endoscopic tube any kind of scope is something that i will put with glutaraldehyde so basically the first set of chemicals that i wish to teach you all are alcohols and aldehydes most important alcohol that is being used isopropyl alcohol everyone has seen this as a concentration of 70 to 80 percent what do you dip inside alcohol something that you never ever clean for a doctor the biggest source of infection that he carries back home or you carry back to your house or your 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 hostel is a stethoscope before leaving the lab one should always sterilize it because this is something you you know you'll wash your hands you'll take all your precautions you'll uh, wear a different set of clothes but something that you've forgotten and you're carrying along with you to your library and to your hostel is a stethoscope which has a very high source of organisms so i so propyl alcohol for stethoscopes and thermometers what do you use aldehydes for we have two types of aldehydes formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde glutaraldehyde i just taught you what you very famously know as the solution sidex sidex glutaraldehyde for all the scopes bronchoscope laryngoscope endoscope proctoscope colonoscope any kind of scope glutaraldehyde coming to formaldehyde you will say formaldehyde has two forms 
One thing is a liquid formalin, which actually I think you know you use in pathology. Pathology specimens you use liquid formalin. That is why when you enter a path lab or even for that matter in anatomy, the cadavers they are also kept in formalin. That is why your eyes. get that burning sensation whenever you enter an anatomy dissection hall or whenever you enter uh, the pathology lab your eyes start burning also because you don't like those places but also because there's a lot of formalin that is over there right okay so having said that that's the liquid version of it whereas there's a gaseous version of formalin that is known as formaldehyde gas which you use for ot fumigation so what all have we studied for ot fumigation if you remember just 2 minutes ago for ot fumigation we studied non ionizing radiation and now for ot fumigation the chemical that we are studying is the formaldehyde gas so coming back to the question i hope this is okay glutaraldehyde is used for all except except thermometer because for thermometers and stethoscope we prefer isopropyl alcohol 70 to 80% okay what are the other types that we have you know what are the other chemicals we also have phenols and halogens phenols i think everyone knows the lysol which is the floor disinfectant or savlon or detol and you put all your sharp instruments in this all those ol crisols savlon detol lysol all of these and sharp instruments cleaning the floors all of these are phenols next one next chemical halogens halogens like iodine i think everyone knows tincture iodine and betadine you've seen that brownish color solution so tincture iodine betadine chloride chloride is also a halogen and our famous most sodium hypochlorite 1% so this is a question that you get in the paper the most potent disinfectant this is a pyq again of the fmg and the neat pg also once asked in the aims exam the most potent disinfectant out of all alcohol glutaraldehyde the halogens iodine or hypochlorite sodium hypochlorite and please remember 1% so why am i emphasizing on 1% because earlier recommendations used to say that sodium hypochlorite we have to use at 10% but that is done no longer we use sodium hypochlorite as 1% and specially what's the other question that you get you are an intern and by mistake you spilled the blood on the floor you are an intern you are collecting blood from a patient you are taking a blood sample by mistake your hand moves and the blood spills on the floor what chemical are you going to use 1% sodium hypochlorite okay talking about the last chemical that we have and that is going to be we are talking all in chemicals we've only been talking about things like liquids for example we are talking about formalin glutaraldehyde uh, lysol or uh, betadine or liquids alcohols or liquids but remember even gas can cause sterilization and what do you have to know out here that when we are dealing with gaseous material we are talking about which gas ethylene oxide eto it might be written in the exam as eto remember eto is ethylene oxide and never ever use ethylene oxide as 100% never you have to dilute it you have to mix it with other gases like nitrogen and all you use it now the latest recommendations say earlier they used to say use it as a 10% the latest recommendations say 3% so remember 3% ethylene oxide is something that we use why don't we use it as a 100% because it is inflammable it will catch fire and number 2 it is also said to be carcinogenic if you use it as a 100% it will be carcinogenic as well as it will be inflammable i don't want to take either of the risks i use it as a 3% where do i use it cardiopulmonary machines for the sterilization of cardiopulmonary machines we use ethylene oxide if someone asks you what is the control remember g for g for gas sterilization the control is bacillus globi g so i think we made a list some time back and i finally can finish that list for all of you the list of the different controls that we did let's add on to it so if someone asks you what is the control for gas sterilization you will say g for g and that is going to be bacillus globi g one of the control questions is always always expected it's an all time favorite in fact this has come in your previous years also bacillus globi g is used as a control for i don't think this is going to be a problem bacillus globi g is used for the control of gas sterilization which gas am i talking about ethylene oxide let me take a test of other options also what do we use for autoclave 
high temperature i hope you remember we use bacillus sterothermophilus coming to the next what do we use for hot air oven for hot air oven we use bacillus subtilis or we have other things like atrophius or we have other things like clostridium tetani then one more thing is written over here which we have not studied and that is known as plasma sterilization although it's not very important for the fmg exam i'll give you an overview we are see what are the three states of matter that we always study taking you back into school time you will say we always study solid liquid gas these are the three states of matter but do you know the fourth state of matter the fourth state of matter is plasma so that is what they are saying see we've understood solids we've used filters we've used liquids like alcohol glutaraldehyde betadine so many liquids we've used we've also used gases like ethylene oxide finally we say we use the fourth state of matter that is we convert h2o2 using h2o2 we make plasma and plasma is used for sterilization please remember for plasma also the control is bacillus sterothermophilus reminding you plasma is another state of matter you are making it out of h2o2 and this also uses a, a you know a, a similar control you can say as that for autoclave and that is bacillus sterothermophilus so i'll add it over here autoclave number 1 and plasma sterilization both of them are going to utilize bacillus sterothermophilus now i can say that all your important control tables are done all said and done what's the last topic that you have to know the last topic that you have to know is you are now on the other side means you have to do testing you have to do testing and you have to tell me so for example i am uh, opening a small little setup of my clinic of my own and i want to find out that what is the best uh, sterilization disinfection technique that i should have at my clinic so i call you because you guys are experts so i call you and i say i am sending a solution to you guys this solution is a solution named x you don't know whether this is an alcohol whether this is iodine whether this is hypochlorite i say i have a solution in my lab in my clinic i want you to tell me that am i using the right thing for my sterilization and disinfection or is this potent enough is this efficient enough to sterilize my clinic so you will say that there are four tests i will put your chemical x through four steps and what are those four tests that they ask you in the paper their names are little difficult so be patient the first one is phenol coefficient test or the riedel walker test repeating phenol coefficient test or the riedel walker test what do they do the solution x that you have sent they are going to compare this solution with phenol they say that we know that you know phenol is a very very good disinfectant so is your solution x matching with phenol if it is matching with phenol this means you can use it if it is not matching with phenol means you cannot use it so phenol coefficient test or riedel walker test is comparing your solution x with phenol and telling you but do you see a little bit of a catch you'll say ma'am you've only compared it with phenol phenol isn't the best disinfectant that you have right but the only thing you've compared it with is phenol so maybe you've missed out on so many things have you uh, been able to find out that whether this x will be able to kill fungus whether this will be able to kill the organisms in the soil have you been able to find out that whether this will kill organic matter or not no you just compared it with phenol and done so there is a drawback that is why you come to testing number 2 which i call as the modified riedel walker test you are doing the same thing see the previous one was only riedel walker test now you are doing a modified riedel walker test which means that again the phenol component is there but you will also test it in the presence of organic matter like soil can it disinfect soil can it kill the yeast can it kill the fungus the spores so that is now known as the modified riedel walker test or chick martin test chick martin test is a modern name for the riedel walker test two tests are done after this you come to the next one there are two questions that i want to ask you number one i want to ask you how many times can i use this solution x i've used it once today for cleaning my floor or i've used it once today for i've dipped some instruments into it and now if i want to use the same thing tomorrow can i do it or not so will you how will you tell me that you know 
कैन इट बी री यूज हु टेल्स मी अबाउट द री यूज द कपैसिटी कैन इट बी यूज रिपीटेडली कैन इट बी यूज रिपीटेडली दैट इज नोन एज द कपैसिटी टेस्ट to test the capacity and the reusability we have the kelse sykes test we have the kelse sykes test and finally you will tell me that ma'am i have done all the tests at my level now you finally start using it in your clinic and then you tell me whether you are getting good results or not so that is known as the in use test known as the kelse and morer test so repeating these are confusing one is known as kelse sykes and one is known as kelse morer so kelse is common you will have to learn what is sykes and what is morer so sykes has the k sound to it sykes has the k sound to it so this tells you about the capacity whereas kelse morer morer has the u word in it so this tells you about the in use ability so let's make a you know i think best is that if we make a table out of it we'll be very confident so how do i do the testing of a disinfectant you'll say that ma'am there are total of four tests that you are going to do the first test is labeled as the riedel walker test riedel walker test is comparing it with what riedel walker test is basically comparing it with phenol it is a phenol coefficient test that you do but it's a disadvantage because you are only doing it with phenol second you say let's do a modification let us do modified riedel walker test and that has been given a very modern name and that is known as the chick martin test that is referred to as the chick martin test then you say that i want to use i want to know the capacity of the disinfectant i want to know how many times can it be reused second and after this you want to know how many or how can i finally reuse it or can i use it in my lab or not practically the in usability so for capacity test and for in use test the name starts with the same these are kelse tests but for capacity k sound that is this is known as the kelse sykes test and morer's use u word so this is going to be the kelse morer test finally we've got the four tests one for phenol one for modification one for capacity and one for in use ability that is what finishes off this chapter also for you it finishes off both the things that is bacterial genetics as well as sterilization and disinfection and we can conveniently wrap up this session so i hope you guys have been benefiting from the previous one also in case you've missed out on the previous lesson please go and view the general microbiology part this is part 2 of it and going forward the part 3 and 4 will be having mycology that is fungus so do watch out for that as well i hope you guys are are able to grasp it because microbio is not an easy subject undoubtedly but with few mnemonics like i say here and there we are always able to solve anything that's difficult okay so thank you so much guys for joining in and see you in the next next session on the same youtube channel thanks a lot study well all the very best